Hey folks, today I wanna to talk about and explain the most common techniques that you'll see in bluegrass banjo. And those are slides and hammer-ons and pull-offs and bends. And if you think about it, other than just playing a fretted note or an open string, that's kind of all the stuff that you'll be doing. So it's pretty important that you know how to do them and you have a way to practice them. So let's talk about all of that today. But first, you should know that if you want a bonus practice tip for this lesson and tablature for all of my lessons, then you can go to patreon.com slash Eli Gilbert Banjo. That's where I post everything that you can't find here on YouTube. Beyond that, if you could just subscribe to this channel and like this video. That's one of the things that makes these videos possible, and I really appreciate it. Okay, so first, let's talk about slides. It's a relatively easy concept, but it's not always that easy to do. And interestingly, it's often one of the first things people end up doing, especially if they play a tune like Cripple Creek. So let's talk about how to get a good sound when you do a slide. The first thing you wanna do is to make sure that the initial attack on the string is strong enough that the note is gonna ring while you're sliding because you're actually sliding across frets and each fret that you cross slightly reduces the amount of vibration in the string. So you wanna make sure you get enough sound in the first place. And on that note, if you apply a lot of pressure to the fretboard as you're sliding across the frets, then you're gonna to contribute to that loss of volume. So we need to find kind of a sweet spot between too much pressure and not enough pressure. If there's too much, then you'll get this sound. And if there's not enough pressure, you'll get this sound. That means that you need to experiment with different amounts of pressure. And it doesn't take a lot, but it'll take a minute for you to get used to what that sweet spot is. Another thing you might have to think about with slides is when to do the slide. I'm sure you heard some people slide like this. And I'm sure you've heard some people slide like this. And the truth is, it's a little easier to slide immediately. But that's not actually what the music always calls for. For instance, listen to the beginning of Cripple Creek the way Earl Scruggs plays it. So in that situation, you're gonna to wanna to slide immediately. That's great. But what about the way that Earl Scruggs plays a song like Hot Corn, Cold Corn? That sounds great with the slide not happening immediately. And you're gonna to wanna to be able to do both of these. And you're also gonna to wanna to be able to listen to the music that you wanna emulate and decipher which of those two things is happening. Now, that's the basic concept of a slide, and you're gonna run into that all the time if you continue to learn about bluegrass banjo. But there's something else that you can do to actually make it sound more like bluegrass. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but when bluegrass musicians slide specifically from the second to the third fret on the G string of the banjo, they actually give it a little bit of a bend. And I know that seems like a really small detail, weirdly specific, but listen to the difference between these two licks. So how do you do that? Well, you're just gonna give the string a slight bend on the way from two to three. And on its own, it sounds terrible. Listen to this. But again, listen to some of these licks that include that bend. It just sounds more like bluegrass. So most of the time when you slide on the banjo, this is not gonna be something you need to do. But specifically in that instance, sliding from two to three, and all the many licks that include that, you're gonna to wanna to do this. It's worth it, I promise. And when it comes to practicing slides, you're obviously gonna to wanna to find some material that includes slides, but that doesn't mean that you can't practice them on their own. One exercise you could do is just to pick a fret distance, maybe just two frets for now, and try sliding that distance on each string. As you get more comfortable, you can slide further. The further you can slide, the more control you actually have over the slide, and that's a good thing. So push yourself. Okay, now let's talk about pull-offs. What is a pull-off? Well, it's pretty simple. It's kind of what it sounds like. You're gonna play a note and you're gonna pull off of that note 
which lets the note below it ring. But here's what most people don't get about pull-offs. You're not just lifting your finger and letting the note below it ring. You're actually kind of playing the string again with the finger on your left hand. Listen to the difference between these two pull-offs. Obviously, the second one is more what we're looking for. And here's a really easy way to practice this. You don't even have to play the first note. Just do the pull-off. If you're doing that correctly, then you're going to hear the note ring below the note that you're pulled off of. And with this technique, there's a couple options. Some people will pull down towards the floor. Some people will kind of push up towards the ceiling, kind of the same effect. All of these are valid, but you're going to have to experiment and see what works for you. What we're looking for is a certain sound, so chase that sound. Now, when it comes to practicing pull-offs, there's a couple things you can do. You can try pulling off from a fretted note to an open string, and try that on each string. But you can also try pulling off from a fretted note to another fretted note. And with that, there's a lot of options. You could pull off from your middle finger to your index finger, or your ring finger to your index finger, from your little finger to your middle finger. You can do a lot of different things, and they're all worth practicing. So, similar to the way that we practice slides, just pick a certain distance, like maybe two frets or three frets, and do a pull off on each string using that distance. And by the way, remember that weird bend that we added to the slide between two and three on the third string? Well, you can do that with pull-offs as well. When you pull off from three to two, if you want to give it more attitude, you can give it a little bit of a bend, like this. Similar to the pull-off, kind of the opposite, is the hammer-on. Really, it's actually even more simple. You're just playing a note and then slamming your finger down on a higher note so that it rings as loud as the first note. And that's an important aspect of this, that you actually get an even volume across both notes. It's really easy to play the first note and then kind of weakly press down on the second note, like this. But what we're really looking for is this. And here's what's difficult about that. If you're just starting out, your fingers might not be that strong. So pressing down like that might not be that easy. But beyond that, it can be really difficult to accurately hit the string exactly where you want to. It's kind of a small target. So one thing you can do is practice slowly. It's not gonna give you the right sound right now, but it is gonna help you accurately hit the string where you want to. Then as that gets more comfortable, you're gonna to wanna to do this faster and faster and with more power so that you can get an even volume across both notes. And just like the slide and just like the pull off, when we hammer on from two to three on the third string, it's worth giving it a little bit of a bend, like this. And if we do that, then when we have a combination of hammer-ons and pull-offs, we can get some really interesting and now bluesy sounding licks. Okay, just like with the pull-offs, with hammer-ons, we're gonna to wanna to practice this with a variety of fret distances and different finger combinations. Because obviously we can hammer-on from an open string to a fretted note. But we can also hammer-on from a fretted note to another fretted note.
And again, we can use any combination of fingers to achieve this. And the more that we're comfortable with, the more versatile we're gonna be, and the more flexible we'll be, and the more music we'll be able to play. But be careful that you're actually getting the sound that you want, because if you're not, then you can just go back to the drawing board and continue practicing like this, looking at the minute details. This is something that you can tweak throughout your entire life. It's something I think about all the time. Okay, there's one more thing that we need to talk about, and that is bends. And it's something that's not that common in bluegrass, maybe more common now, but it's possible that you're familiar with this classic Earl Scruggs lick. Unfortunately, what you've probably heard from a lot of people is more like this. But we just wanna make sure we're not doing kind of a small, weak bend. We want a big, strong bend. And I know this isn't always easy to do. It can be hard depending on the setup of your banjo or the gauge of your strings, or maybe your experience level to actually bend the string and especially to bend the string accurately to a certain note. But here's a couple things that you might wanna think about. First of all, you actually do want to be using your finger to bend the string. I know that your hand is stronger than your fingers and your arm is stronger than your fingers, but due to the way that we actually hold the banjo and the kind of leverage that's involved, I see some people trying to use their entire arm or their hands in a really weak position to bend the string and it just doesn't work. So if you can firmly hold the neck of the banjo, then your finger's actually gonna have enough leverage to bend that string. And then that's gonna be something that you're gonna practice on its own. So just try bending the string without playing the lick, without playing anything else, just try that. And this couldn't be closer to any analogy of lifting weights or exercising than any other technique. You're literally just pushing up the string, adding resistance and increasing the pitch. And so maybe one day it's a little harder to do and then the next day it's a little easier. Eventually it's nothing, I promise, it gets easier. And when it comes to practicing this, well, you're probably just gonna wanna play a lick like this or anything else that you come across that includes a bend but you can also practice the technique on its own by bending a string to a specific note. So maybe think about bending this note, C, up to a D. You can do the same thing by going to D flat or C sharp. Your ability to do this accurately is what's gonna make the licks that involve bends sound good. So what's interesting is that these licks that we've talked about, again, are most of what you're gonna do when you play bluegrass banjo. You'll play some open strings, you'll play some fretted notes, but pretty much everything else is either a slide or a hammer-on or a pull-off or a bend. So I think it's worth your time to make sure that you have those techniques shored up. That way, when you approach a new tune, you'll have all the tools you need to play it well. And it might not happen today, and it might not happen tomorrow, but if you're attentive to this, then you are gonna build these skills and then you'll just have them and they'll be your skills. They'll be your style because the way that you slide and the way that you hammer on and the way you pull off, that'll be yours. If you go listen to people like Earl Scruggs or J.D. Crow or Ron Stewart or anyone, they all do it a little bit differently. So this is your chance to leave your mark on the bluegrass banjo language. I think that's pretty cool. Anyway, if you're looking for some material to practice this, then check out all my other videos. Pretty much everything I posted is full of all of these techniques. And of course, you can find the tablature for all of these on patreon.com slash Eli Gilbert Banjo. Okay, that's all for today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.